I'm officially recording and I'm about to go live on Facebook. So everybody was aware of that. All right, going live. All right, there we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Villa Avenue Business Improvement District's Uncover What's Next Developers Forum. I want to, sorry, can, are you guys getting this feedback? I'm fine. Okay, just wanna make sure. I'm getting feedback. I'm getting feedback. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm gonna I have to kill one of these. All right. So good morning, everyone. Once again, welcome to the Miller Avenue Business Improvement District's Uncover What's Next Developers Forum. Today we will be showcasing uh, development opportunities in our business improvement district. And we will be showcasing our historic 96 year old theater, the historic Ritz Villa. And we will be having a panel discussion with industry experts that will be able to talk more about uh, the restoration of historic buildings and uh, I'm sorry, I have some stream feedback. I gotta, I'm sorry, I'm here. The Facebook Live was just giving way too much feedback and I'm not sure what that was. But we have a panel of industry experts that will be talking about how to restore historic buildings, uh, the value that they bring to the community, um, how to get, you know, how to get it done. Um, and so first and foremost, I want to uh, introduce our alderman, Ashanti Hamilton, to say a few words, if you, if you could, please. Well, thank you, Angelique. Um, and thank you for organizing this because I think we are, um, in the midst of a renaissance over here on Villard Avenue. Um, and we wanna roll out the welcome mat for all of the creative ideas uh, to help us get this historic building back into the mix on Villard Avenue. Um, you know, we, you just mentioned uh, that this building is almost a hundred years old. Um, you know, this little strip of land used to be um, the downtown commercial strip for Old North Milwaukee before it was annexed to the city of Milwaukee. And the history that exists here and the opportunity um, that we have for uh, some developer uh, to make its mark on the city of Milwaukee for the next hundred years. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, this, the, the neighborhood is turning around, the strip is turning around, there's been great investment along Villard Avenue, um, there's great momentum that's happening now. Um, I want to uh, thank the uh, Villard Avenue Business Association as well uh, for the continued work uh, and investment in the area, so there's uh, business support uh, for this project. So um, I'm excited. Uh, especially since the uh, since um, of the organizing of the charrette a couple years ago, um, that came up with so many great possibilities of what could happen over here on Villar. Um This could be, you know, the 
catalytic development project um, that brings uh, all of the pieces that we've been seeing happening over the uh, last couple years, bring these pieces together. So um, I'm excited about this uh, commitment. Um, I am looking forward to the wonderful ideas. Um, and hopefully we learn a little bit about the building and about the possibilities at this location. Um, Cause I, I can already see just from the attendance here today um, that there's excitement about what can happen at this location. So thank you, Angelique, for organizing this and uh, bringing all these entities together. Um, and let's continue to push forward. And I'm excited uh, to see uh, what comes of our discussion here today. Thank you. Um, and also right before we get started, um, I wanted to invite Vanessa Coaster from the city of Milwaukee. She's our deputy commissioner for the city of Milwaukee, uh, Department of the city of Milwaukee, Department of Development. Uh, would you like to say a few words, Vanessa? And I see you, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. You'd think by now I'd have that down, right? <laughs> Hi, Angelique and everyone. Uh, thanks for creating this event. The city is excited to be a partner. The development uh, Department of City Development has been involved uh, with the Villard Avenue bid in several ways. Uh, several months ago with the design charrette through our planning division. And uh, now today our real estate uh, section helping out with uh, the real estate of the theater group. So thanks for having us and look forward to hearing the panel discussion. Um, as well as our, I know our uh, esteemed colleague uh, are part of the panel today. Thank you. Thank you. And I just uh, wanted to make sure that I acknowledge our um, our bid board online. Um, we have uh, Brian Rott, our president, as well as Mike Melatesta, who is our vice president on board. So if you guys could at least wave so everybody knows it's you, they can see you. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna jump right in and share my presentation with you all and show you the properties that we have available. So I'm going to, do I want to do the actual slideshow? There we go. All right, so We'll just jump right in. So for, um, I work at Havenwoods Economic Development Corporation and um, we collaborate with the Villa Avenue Business Improvement District. Um, we awarded the contract to manage the Villa Avenue Business Improvement District. So for the last four years, we have had all hands on deck, hitting the ground running, um, doing everything in our power to restore Villa's historic vibrancy. Um, and our core revitalization strategies for revitalizing this area is um, design, economic vitality, safety, promotion, and capacity building. So I'm going to jump right in. All right. So um, for the past, uh, this year makes 25 years that the Villa Avenue Business Improvement District has been um, a, an alliance of business and building and commercial landowners um, who take on extra tax assessment on their properties and they pull their money together and recycle that money in their district. And then we partner with city, um, city development, DPW, um, different departments and organizations to uh, revitalize this area. So the, what you're seeing right now is the map the existing map that's been here for the past 24 years. Um, last year, we successfully expanded the bid. Um, and what, what you'll see is uh, pretty much all of the parcels that are colored are buildings. And the original map, um, there are buildings that were adjacent to um, businesses that were a part of the bid that, would, that couldn't receive 
the services that we provide for the bid. So we um, asked those businesses if they wanted to get our advocacy, to get our support, and um, they voted that they wanted to and the city approved it. So the map that you see on the right is where we are now. So what this did was it, um, it doubled the size of our bid. So it went from 110 parcels to two, over 230 parcels and it tripled our annual operating budget as well to allow us to really provide grants, um, to provide uh, all of the services that we provide as far as um, rev uh, revitalizing the streetscape, um, providing cleanup support, again, grants, promotion, um, everything that we do is for all of all 230 um, businesses that we have. And so for economic vitality, one of our biggest projects today is our um, Villa Avenue Brownfield Remediation Initiative. Uh, we recently uncovered um, many brownfields right on the main corridor. So what you're looking at, um, these parcels that are uh, purple, that are cut, um, circled in blue, are our brownfield sites. So, um, which means that they um, have, they are either likely contaminated or they have been um, tested and confirmed so, uh, as contaminated. So the, and what this means is the use of it, um, where it could have been like an old dry cleaners, they use chemicals, certain things, the um, Department of Natural Resources automatically identifies being a brownfield. So it could be perceived or actual, yeah, but we won't know, we don't know until we test them. Um, so these, some of them have been tested and some of them have not. This is really important to us because environmental health is public health. And so we know that brownfield blight um, leads to urban decay. Often the buildings just sit and just decay. Um, and blight leads to higher crime, lower property values, lower tax base, reduces availability, availability of social services and uh, reduce social capital or lost community connections really overall contributes to a deteriorate, deteriorating quality of life for the people um, and the businesses that reside over here. So um, the, the, the environmental health side of it is that um, these could potentially be site and groundwater contamination um, and it, it could be air, um, things that could be moved, it could be asbestos. So it's a lot of different things that this contributes to, but this is very important to us. Um, so much so as um, we wanted to um, uh, take this lot here on Hopkins and, and Villard and do a farmer's market. But then we found out that um, the city owns it and it was actually once a gas station. So there's tankers um, and all kinds of things under the ground. We just recently uh, completed the testing and we've been working with the um, city development environmental team um, and planners, including Amy Olaf, who's on this call, shout out to Amy and Tori. Um, we are uh, putting together a proposal to make this into the flex space that we designed in our historic charrette. And this is what we hope that it will look like. This picture here, um, a flex space that we can have activity. Um, we really don't have much public green space in our district. So this is one that we are really um, working hard to um, bring this vision to life. And this rendering was again done in our historic charrette by the Smith Group. And then another um, brownfields. So I just wanna share some of the brownfields that will be in a pipeline. These properties, um, this one is on 32nd and Villa, right across from Oasis Lounge, if you know where that is. Um, it's both the, the parcel on the left and the, the lot on the right. They are, um, they, it is uh, deemed a brownfield. We have not gotten access yet to test it, but if you are a developer and you're interested in this property, please do inquire with the city. Um, you can literally go um, on the city's website. They have an entire page donate, um, did it, dedicated to Brownfield um, information to show you how you can actually acquire these properties. Um, 
And then this is another potential brownfield site in the pipeline. We're just now getting access to get testing. Um, so it's the property on the left, the property on the right, and the field in between. This is um, on the corner of 31st, right across the street, just west of the CVS, which sits on Titania and Villard. And this is another property that is a brownfield. Um, they, they, both of the properties have outstanding taxes in excess of about 10 years. Um, and we will be working with the city to see if we can acquire these properties and make them available to developers in the near future. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, properties that we have available right now. This parcel that you're looking at sits right on the corner of 35th and Villard, right uh, just west from the new Villard um, Square Library. This property, uh, both six storefronts on the ground floor, including two very large ones that are on the Villa Avenue side. One is currently occupied by a retailer. Um, and there's uh, three or three to four other storefronts on the 35th Street side. In the past, it's been used for salons, radio stations, gaming, et cetera. And then the upper floors houses about seven apartment units with extra space as well. The direct, linking, the, the direct link to the listing is below. Um, please drop your email in the chat and we will make sure that everybody who wants a copy of this presentation um, gets it. Another property that's also available right now is 5070 North 35th Street, uh, probably one of my favorite buildings in our district. Um, it's a classic old North Milwaukee flex um, building for lease. And um, as you can see, it's over 60,000 square feet. Um, it sits on over about three and a half acres and it's three stories, very well kept building in great shape. Um, I encourage you guys to um, definitely take a look at it, tour it and see if it fits your needs. Um, a fun fact about this building is that it it, it was one of two buildings that originally housed the Meisselbach Bicycle Company, which one of their most notable employees was William Harley, um, one of two parts of Harley Davidson. So that's some great history that started on Villa Avenue. And other potential uh, development of pipeline is the, former, the site of the former Villa Library. Um, as you can see, this property is significant, takes up three fourths of a city block. Um, it's only one other building on that block um, on 33rd and Villard. We also re-envisioned this property in our, our charrette call, calling for new construction, housing, event space, incubators, um, vendors, commercial kitchen, et cetera, for the full report um, for the charrette that details this property. You can find it on our website, but also I've included the link in this slide, which again, I can also forward to you guys. And then today's feature property, I would like to introduce Nick Carnahan from Galbraith and Carnahan Architects that led the charrette design for this property. Are you there, Nick? I'm here, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Good morning. Uh, you want me to talk a little bit about it right now? Yeah, yep, go ahead. OK. Yep. Great. Yeah. So just having, uh, informal. We're just having a conversation, by the way. All so. right. <laughs> well, well, thanks for putting this together. I think um, this is such a cool neighborhood, and uh, it's great that you were able to get everybody on a, a Zoom call here this morning to focus in on the potential and the opportunity that I think is in this neighborhood. Um, so, as Angelique mentioned, my name is Nick Carnahan. I'm with Galbraith Carnahan Architects. And we were part of the, uh, the charrette a couple years ago now that uh, Carolyn S. Wine with CDS at uh, UW-Milwaukee put on. And our project in that charrette was to assess the Villard Avenue Ritz Theater and see what could be done uh, with that, try to reimagine a, a second life for this historic theater. Um, so it was uh, built nearly 100 years ago. Um, it was sort of the main theater on the, the north side here. And um, we toured as part of the 
part of the charrette ahead of the, the two design sessions that we had. We toured through the building. And um, if you're going over there later today, um, you'll get to see the inside of it yourself. Uh, but one thing that we came away with was that it's, it's a, a cool building, but it's also in uh, a pretty far state of disrepair. So there's been some uh, roof leaks in the building that have let water in over time. And um, if you've been in enough uh, uh, closed up buildings, you know that water is sort of the, the enemy of a building and it can tear things apart very quickly. You can see in that bottom left-hand photo uh, above the stage there, some of the, some of the damaged areas that uh, have been caused by the, the water infiltration into the building. So if you want to advance the slide. slide. Um, so when we were, so when we were thinking about, thinking about how to, how to, this is, I'm, we're getting a little bit of feedback right now. Feedback. And Lake, you need everybody to mute. That's what it is, I think. Can everybody please mute if you're not speaking? I'll take a look to see if I can okay. help you. Oh, I think it, oh, we're good now. All right. Yeah, we're good. So, so when we approached the project, you know, understanding the the condition that it was in, um, I mean, as architects, we're sort of a idealistic bunch. Um, we like to imagine what could be, and um, what we learned fairly quickly in starting our firm um, ten years ago was that the reason behind everything that exists in the city is almost always money. Um, and that was a uncomfortable truth for us to learn in that, you know, if you wonder th why things are the way they are or why they aren't the way you want them to be, um, it usually comes down to the almighty dollar. And so in approaching how to salvage and save the theater, because uh, we do think it's a very important piece of the, the Villard Avenue uh, neighborhood, you know, we looked at it from a developer standpoint with sort of the money, through the money lens, I'll call it. Um, and, you know, in looking at the building, the outside on Villard Avenue is, it's in pretty good shape for being a hundred years old. Um, I certainly hope I'm that sh in that good a shape when I'm 96 years old, uh, you know, but the, it was really the interior of the building that um, kind of troubled us. If you want to advance the slide. Um, this is a, a rendering of the back side of the building. Um, so the one interesting fact with this uh, this parcel is that the there's a there's a nice piece of land on the back along the alley that comes with it. So we saw that as a, a opportunity for parking areas um, and outdoor space. Uh, if you want to advance to the next slide, um, so we looked at it from a you know, how a developer would look at it uh, as far as what's the, the money that you're going to need to put into the, the project. So again, these are $20, $20. So if you know anything about the cost of construction in the last two years, uh, there's a giant asterisk next to these numbers. But, um, you know, our, we estimated uh, the full rehabilitation of the, the building was going to be, uh, you know, north of two point six million dollars. Um, the, you know, a, a demolition of the building is probably forty thousand uh, dollars. So we settled on the idea of a selective demolition and rebuild, where you're taking parts of the building down. And I think you saw in some of those earlier slides uh, where we would create um, sort of an outdoor theater, an outdoor performance space. And so not only does that allow you to keep your initial construction costs down, but if you want to advance the slide. Uh, it also, you know, 
you need to look at annual operating expenses. So it's not just the money that you spend initially, but it's the money that you spend over time. And so uh, if you were to, you know, these are, again, these are 2018 or 19 numbers at this point, but uh, if you're to operate this as a full building, you're looking at about $17.98 per square foot uh, per year in all of those various categories of groundskeeping, real estate, uh, utilities, parking, repair, maintenance, cleaning. Um, so what we thought, if you wanna head to the next slide, was the, ah, here's the, here's the construction costs again. So you can see, um, you know, the surgical demolition that we're talking about, I, I think could be accomplished, uh, you know, for under the, the $60,000 number. Um, all right, let's look at the next slide. Um, so then uh, back to the, uh, back to the, operating costs over time. Um, so obviously it's gonna take more money to operate uh, a project with a larger mortgage uh, if you were to do the full rehab on the project, but then it's also gonna take uh, heat and um, uh, a lot more maintenance on a, on a full building. So one thought that we had in our design was by sort of taking the roof off of the theater part and really exposing that to the elements, it's a it becomes a three season theater, um, but then you're also pushing your operating costs um, down significantly. By you're, you're essentially it's the operating costs of a really nice park versus a, a full blown theater. Um, and then this is the, so these are kind of a detail of what we thought the operating costs on a, an open air theater would be over time. Next slide. Oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that looks like someone else's uh, topic, but, um, you know, ultimately what we were trying to do in the, you know, in the in this project is save the, the front face of the building, the part that everyone identifies with. You know, you drive past it every day. Um, it's very recognizable along that stretch. And I think it's important that that stays as part of this neighborhood. Um, but then also, you know, try to find a realistic solution to what could be done here um, with the amount of money that I think uh, is, is likely to be able to be invested into this property. Um, and then I think kind of a, yeah, if you wanna back up to sort of those kind of inspirational slides, um, you know, the part that really got us excited is sort of those idealistic architects that I talked about at the, the beginning was this, is, this could be a space unlike anything else that we've got in the city. Um, and I think for, this to be a viable uh, sort of development and a viable idea, it's got to attract people. It's got to be this unique space that you can't get um, outside of the Villard neighborhood. And you've got to you've got to really do something compelling with this property to bring people in. Um, and the more people you bring in, uh, the more dollars you bring in. And so that you know. That helps the, the bid district, it helps the neighborhood in general. Um, and so we saw this as really kind of a catalytic project for the neighborhood. Um, you know, it's the, the city owns the property. And so it's, it's not in, uh, you know, private hands at this point. So it's, there's a, there's a party willing and able to sell it to, um, you know, somebody that's ready to, roll up their sleeves and kind of do the hard work of creating something great here. So we're pretty excited about the, the potential here. And um, yeah, if you've, I don't know if you've, you wanted to have questions right now, Angelique, or if you've got uh, more agenda ahead of you. Yes, if anybody has any questions specifically for Nick um, in his rendering, um, please do um, unmute yourself and, and ask your questions. I think I had one too, Nick. 
Yeah. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Hi, this is Miranda from R3 Elevated. Question in the uh, condition for use, does that allow for live music as well as theater performances? Um, I mean, that could be kind of a zoning question. Um, so, I, you know, I think that, uh, I, I don't want to speak for the city, but I think that they would be, um, you know, it might be flexible and in, in kind of coming up with a, a unique zoning category um, for this, because it really is sort of a different animal than, a, than an enclosed theater. Um, but yeah, we, we saw it as kind of a live, live music, uh, arts and theater. Um, and so there's something that would operate maybe April through October, uh, in the warmer months. Awesome. Nick, I just had one question. Where, where did you get this idea from? Where, where did you see this that kind of really piqued your interest in you know it it was really um i mean we were it was in the tour of the building where we saw kind of how far gone some sections were um you know and then contrasting that with how how reasonably good shape the front 20 feet of the building are in um you know so it was it was sort of that um that idea of what could you do with it um, and then, um, I, you know, I don't know if, if we, I, I think we, we came up with the idea first, but then we started exploring like, well, what other outdoor performance centers are there? Um, and there's, turns out there's quite a few. Um, so we found, uh, a number, uh, in the United States. I think the most local one is the uh, American Players Theater in Spring Green. So if any of you have ever been to that, it's a, you know, a Shakespeare performance area uh, up on the top of a hill in, in the woods outside of Spring Green. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's, it's not something that hasn't been done before, um, but I think it's being done in sort of a unique way here within the shell of this old building. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there was a question. Um, I'm not sure if it, this might be a your uh, something you can answer or Dwayne. Um, do you, do we know how many parking spaces are there in that lot behind the theater? I I did know that at one time two years ago. But I'd have to go back and look at my site plan to to let you know. I think it's yep. uh, 15, maybe 20, somewhere in there. Okay. Actually, on the listing page, Nick and Angelique, it it indicates that there are 24 spaces for surface parking back there. Okay. Behind the building. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We appreciate this. It's been two years. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Charles asks, um, where where is Spring Green? I'm not. I'm uh, not Spring Green, it's a it's a small town in southwestern Wisconsin. Um, awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nick. Um, you know, this, uh, this was uh, absolute pleasure and a blast um, over, uh, over the pandemic planning with you guys, you know, uh, full disclaimer to everybody on the line. Um, it was extremely important to us when we worked for each one of these sites um, we have some of the best designs that could have that we could have gotten from anybody. And part of that was the discussion with these um, architectural firms that took us took our plight serious. And our plight was that, you know, um, disenfranchised communities often get thrown bones. And we really wanted to the 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 best renderings that we can get, the best possible vision that we can get, even if we have to, you know, take steps to get there, to actualize these things. Um, we, what we didn't want was kind of, you know, low level, um, you know, designing and planning and these guys went all in. So again, shout outs to you guys, Nick, we really appreciate you. And thanks again too for um, co-presenting with me on today. You bet. Thanks for uh, putting this on. This is cool.
No problem. All right, so um, moving on to the end, we're about to start the, um, the panel discussion. Just wanted to um, share a little bit about our promotion of our district. Um, our, our branding um, is invest on support. You know, all these photos are of real businesses, buildings um, on the left. That's actually the Villa Commons apartment building that's open now. It was a groundbreaking that we did. Um, but we want people to invest. We want people to own and we want people to support. That's the only way that we'll be able to build and sustain. And so um, we just invite you, you all to stay tuned as we uncover what's next on the app. So I would like to introduce my executive director of Havenwood's Neighborhood Partnership, Stephanie Harling. She will be moderating the panel. Stephanie, are you on the line? I am, I'm right here. All right, so you ready? You ready? To get started? I'm Let's ready. Get started. All right, welcome everybody. And thank you to our panelists that are willing to share your vast knowledge on a variety of subjects today. So I think where we wanna start is the basics. Um, about preservation and the importance of preservation. So Julia, I'm gonna to look to you to kick us off yeah. on this topic. So can you talk to us a little bit about the importance to a city in restoring historic buildings? Uh, certainly, and um, thank you to Angelique. Um, we're really excited to be here. I work for Historic Milwaukee and we've been working with um, Villard uh, Avenue bid since 2019. So I'll touch on that a little bit with some other questions, but preservation, I think Nick really touched on it in his opening that the, the building is unique. It's interesting to look at, but it's also this idea that um, people like kind of in more academic circles called placekeeping. We've probably all heard about placemaking, but placekeeping is this idea that um, history and community don't happen in a vacuum. It isn't just the physical place, but it's this continuity of community and memory and culture um, beyond just the physical structure, which in this case has a lot of uh, unique architectural details that you can't find in a big box store. You can't produce the same way that they used to. Um, the environmental impact of preservation the greenest building is the one that's already been built. So preserving as much of that embodied energy that's already gone into materials is really important. Um, and then, uh, you know, the idea that there are things you can't get anymore. Cream City Brick is my favorite Milwaukee example. Um, it's something we love here, but they don't make it anymore. It's not something you can just produce. So it's, it's, uh, it's not only that, but, um, as we've talked about, people enjoy looking at things that are different from their hometown. There's only one Villard Avenue, there's only one Milwaukee, preserving things that are special to those neighborhoods and places and have been for a long time is really vital to keeping Milwaukee authentic and genuine. So Julia, following up on that, mm -hmm. um, do you have any examples um, of other projects in Milwaukee where you've seen an impact on not only the culture of the community, but also an economic impact and the catalytic nature of a project of, of that, of that yeah. scope. And I, we do an event called Doors Open. So there's lots of different options I could pick from. I tried to pick some that were kind of similar in building scale to the theater that we're talking about or some of the other buildings on Billard. Um, the uh, Bader Philanthropies pair of buildings is a great example. So. Bader moved into a building from uh, 1927, which was a retail complex, uh, which had storefronts and apartments. And then they actually purchased and rehabilitated a bank building from, I'm checking my notes, 1910, just north. So that's Bader Philanthropies. And then the building that they rehabilitated has a Sam's Place, the Jazz Cafe, and then a series of wellness um, traditional Chinese medicine, some different um, kind of more boutique types of providers. So that's a kind of pair of buildings that are bringing uh, energy back to that part of King Drive. Another um, example that I love is the Maranta plant shop at the other end of King Drive, uh, which was essentially a historic storefront that got white boxed. And then the, the business, small business um, that was brought in as a minority owned plant shop. That's another great point about preservation. Small businesses love historic buildings. They're unique. They set small businesses apart. They make the community feeling of shopping. If you've been in there, if you've had their delicious food from their food truck, like you can't really um, 
replicate that in any storefront anywhere. It really is that that particular place. Okay. Thanks so much, Julia. So turning our attention to Rick Banks from DCD. Rick, do you have any examples of catalytic projects similar to the Villa Theater um, that DCD has supported? Good morning, everybody. Um, and again, mm -hmm. thank you all for hosting the space. Um, so my time with the DCD has been very, uh, fairly brief. I just started a year ago, but thinking back on some of the more uh, historic and bigger catalytic projects, I think most people know of like the schools, uh, a lot of NPS schools, um, like uh, Garfield Avenue School here uh, in the Bronzeville community. Um, also Jackie Robinson School, which is closer to, to Tony and, and uh, Hampton over there. Those have been successfully turned into uh, either senior apartments or uh, affordable housing and things like that. And those projects have been uh, very big and catalytic for those communities. Uh, other buildings have been, like uh, was previously mentioned, just smaller uh, retail businesses that really kind of add up and contribute to the character and feel of the street. Um, working on a project now in the Harambe neighborhood um, where uh, an old store that's been vacant for probably about 20 or 30 years is going to become a, a local carpenters uh, workshop and store with our nonprofit above it. Um, and just continue to, to support other projects using the other, other funds that we have available, uh, supporting businesses that are moving into previously vacant storefronts and helping them white box the space or helping them get new signage and things like that. Um, I think this is probably gonna be one of the, the biggest and uh, most unique projects that the city's RFP just because it is such a historic property. Um, and it is an old theater that has the potential to become, uh, you know, a theater once more. So excited for that. Mm -hmm. I would also add in maybe a, a, in recent history, maybe um, a, how can I, an, an area that has been uh, not high on the, on the agenda for historic preservation. So mm -hmm. we're excited to see that be moved up um, yeah. in priority. So thanks, thanks, Rick. Um, now, I think that DCD and Lee, I'm, Lee Barzak, um, I'm turning to you. I think that DCD did have a role in your theater developments. And I just wanted to um, kind of pick your brain a little bit on um, uh, kind of what piqued your interest in wanting to purchase and restore uh, historic theaters to start with. Maybe we can start there with you, Lee. Thank you. And I apologize to everyone that my camera's on the fritz here. Um, my, my interest in the movie theaters that uh, my wife and I purchased, which, in, which is the Avalon Theater in Bayview and the Times Theater in the Washington Heights neighborhood and the Rosebud Theater in Wauwatosa, uh, stem from the fact that uh, growing up in Milwaukee, I attended movies in dozens of different movie theaters all throughout neighborhoods all over the city. And uh, sadly, you know, many, many of those are gone. And yet um, we believe that just like, you know, a, a great other type of business, like a coffee shop or a restaurant or a barber shop or whatever it might be that, that really becomes um, a catalyst in the neighborhood for people to, to gather and to experience things uh, together that they can share. Um, certainly movie theaters can do the same thing and become something that many, many people in a neighborhood will identify with and then prompt other development. So uh, in buying the theaters that we purchased, um, we wanted to try to bring those back to those neighborhoods and you know, further advance what was already going on, at least in, in, uh, at the time in, in Bayview. And then what really started to uh, take off on North Avenue there in Wauwatosa. And now what we're seeing is uh, some of that in, on Leaf Street in the Washington Heights area too, as a number of uh, vacant storefronts have been uh, filled and, and some new businesses are coming in and we've had the opportunity to meet a, a number of these new business owners and it's just it's so it's so uplifting to hear about their excitement and and how they're really working hard to take a place in those neighborhoods and reach out to each other and support one another and and naturally we've seen great support from the communities in all three of these neighborhoods that we've we've tried to um, revive the theaters in so it's, it's been a, a tremendous um, experience and um, it's, a, it's a challenging one when you're talking about movie theaters because there's a lot of factors that, that impact a business uh, within the movie industry. 
And I, and I think that's one of the reasons why, as I watched what Nick was showing, I was particularly taken with that idea because uh, that open air space really um, provides a scale that probably is much more realistic than a movie theater would be there. And it also opens up so many more possibilities there without excluding the idea of showing movies. I mean, I could almost see this become an outdoor movie theater for certain times of the spring, summer, and fall when a, when a um, uh, portable screen could be put up and people from the neighborhood could bring lawn chairs in and watch a movie and have a great time just sharing community in that space, just as likely as you could have concerts or performances. And when you think about that, I mean, that again would be something that's, I think only once have I heard about anything like that in, in Milwaukee Metro. So, I mean, you still could do the movies, but you could sure have a lot of other things going there. And with the, the um, potential uh, cost savings that Nick described as far as, you know, that versus a full-blown renovation, um, that would be very, very important, I think, to any developer because uh, these old movie theaters are wonderful. But um, as if I use the Avalon as an example, I would say about every couple of months we get a review online that says, why don't they do something about their sound system? And let me tell you, we have done a huge amount of investing in the sound system. But when you have these old movie theaters that are full of hard surfaces and plaster walls and a plaster ceiling and everything else, uh, you get a sound experience that is much, much different than the, the newer theaters that are a, a basically a sound deadened black box that really makes um, the sound uh, that comes from modern movies so easy to deal with. And in these older movie theaters, it's, it's anything but easy. So, you know, a, a different approach to that space, in my mind, hits it on the target, right in the bullseye. Thanks, Lee. Um, so I'm going to keep you on the hook for a minute, Lee, as we transition into, you know, how, how the uh, development like this gets done, um, not only in con through the eyes of construction, but also financing. So I'm going to segue a little bit, but keep you, uh, keep you engaged on this question. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the biggest challenges you faced during the renovation of whichever theater you want to talk about? I would imagine probably Avalon was your biggest challenge. Um, with regard to permitting, zoning, any big surprises that a developer should know about when they're considering renovating an old theater or any old building like this? Well, we didn't have any problems with permitting or zoning. And in fact, uh, the city of Milwaukee was extremely helpful. Um, uh, former Alderman Zielinski helped us get a grant of $75,000, which was kind of the seed money we needed to really get uh, architects started on the, on the challenge. Um, the biggest challenge we hit with the building was financing. And it was uh, very difficult to find any financing for um, that or the other two theaters that we, we purchased. And um, fortunately, we had, we had had a few different real estate uh, endeavors that did very, very well. And we were able to just sort of transfer equities into those, those, uh, these, these three buildings. And um, we actually didn't have to worry about the financing issue. But um, the city was very helpful in helping steer us toward um, some resources as well. So when we looked at the historic nature of things, you know, we were given context through the city of Milwaukee for the, the local and the state um, people that would be involved in helping us assess whether we should go for a full-fledged uh, historic renovation of the exterior or, you know, just stick with the old money, or, I'm sorry, the old building uh, tax credits and not go for that full-fledged uh, historic renovation. And we chose the, that, that uh, old building with uh, inputs from a number of people uh, from the city of Milwaukee who were very helpful. And um, it's just made the project more affordable. And as a result of that, um, I think more successful. So uh, just a follow-up question to that, uh, maybe for Lee or uh, some of our other panelists. Um, I would imagine that if, you, if you're looking at, in this case with the Villa Theater of demolition and almost you know, a new kind of use, those historic tax credits would not be applicable because we're altering the building in such a way? 
in my opinion, that would be a big challenge. I, I don't, I don't think they would be uh, the, 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 the old, the historic credits that are much more lucrative to a developer would be tough. Uh, but I think the old building credits would probably be somewhat available. Okay. Um, and in discussion about financing, would you be willing to just kind of briefly share your financing stack? Was it strictly traditional lending or did you bring in a CDFI or MEDC or did you have to kind of do some stacking on that? If you're asking me? Yeah, Lee, yeah. Well, no, actually when we approached uh, the banks that I've done business with, we were basically told they were not interested in the projects whatsoever. Uh, okay. They felt that there was uh, very little um, potential for old movie theaters to become profitable. So we ended up rolling money from other projects in. Okay. So we didn't have any financing at all. Oh, okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to switch my attention to Willie Smith uh, with regard to uh, financing a project like this. Um, Willie, could you talk to us a little bit about, you know, when you would opt for maybe a CDFI loan or a traditional lender and you know how do you become bankable on something like this um hello all um i would say that uh in regards to a deal like that the earlier they come to us the better off it is honestly um, a lot of times we can help them to think through um what the project should look like um how um you know we would look at it how other lenders would look at it and a lot of times uh, for us, it's about, you know, how do we make this thing happen? It doesn't necessarily have to be a Northwest Side CDC deal. Um, we would definitely participate with other lenders. I mean, I literally after this meeting, I have a meeting with uh, MEDC regarding a larger deal that we're working on together that came directly to me. So, you know, it's really about, is, is there a way to move this forward and how would we do it? So, you know, I would say the earlier they come, the better off they are in us trying to assist them. Okay. But, but um, this is in no way out of the question, this kind of a deal. You know, it's just, you know, how do we make sense out of it? How do we ensure that it's the, the cash flows, cash flows are sufficient uh, to, to, to actually pay down the debt? And what is the sustainability, the sustainability factor of this project in general? You know, if we, we're able to answer those questions and figure those things out, you know, that, that really helps a, a great deal in presenting the deal to our loan committee who ultimately makes the loan decision. So we do a lot of the pre-work to ensure that once we get to that point, you know, it's something that's workable. And we try to find other resources that whomever the developer is might not know about so that, you know, we can help to move the project forward. Okay, thanks, Willie. Willie, if, if one of our attendees wanted to um, get the ball rolling on something like this with you, how would they, what does that look like? What's the first step they have to take besides calling you? Um, I would, I'll share my email, um, okay. but typically I'll have like, a, um, like just a general conversation with them to just kind of learn where they are completely informal where they can truly share their thinking. And usually in those sessions, it, it gives us enough information to gauge what direction um, this should go or whether it should go at all. Or, a lot, you know, th there are times when it's like, I don't think you're going to be able to move this forward with what I know about the resources that are out there currently. If you're able to find something else, you know, that's, that, that, that is what it is. But there are, there are a number of times where, you know, we have to give that hard response that I don't see how I could move this forward, you know. But most times there's a way to move the deals forward or, you know, sometimes it's scaling the project and not just pushing for the whole shebang all at once. So, you know, it's, there's, there, there are a number of different ways to tackle these kinds of projects, but um, there's no set formula as to how we do it. It's really just kind of, you know, tearing back the layers and, and figuring out how we can work to move the project forward. Okay. Switching our attention to, to your, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I just want to um, cover a couple of comments that were made. Um, oh, sure. Uh, Amy, um, <clears throat> senior planner at the city, um, commented that um, the theater isn't the, the theater is now a larger site. At first, it was just the theater, um, but uh, when, at the time that we did the charrette, there was an adjacent building that was going through foreclosure that hadn't completed, 
that the city has now coupled with the theater. So it's um, a larger site uh, now. So for one, we do appreciate that um, from the city as well by um, helping to partner with us to make sure that this is a, a you know, this a, a catalytic, you know, um, development. And then Lee also made a comment. Um, Lee, did you want to clarify about the tax tax credits for the National Park Service? Yeah, somebody was asking about those and, uh, you know, there are basically credits that um, you have to get certification through the National Park Service, which is, uh, they're, they're, they're nice, they're a higher amount, I, I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 35% of the, um, the amount of the renovation that qualifies under their guidelines. And uh, that certainly can be a very attractive um, amount. Um, many projects will actually uh, actually sell off those tax credits, if that's a good way of phrasing it, to investors who might be able to utilize them in order to raise more cash, you know, for the uh, the project. Um, but they are very restrictive. And in the case of the Avalon Theater, I would have had to have gone back to a marquee, for instance, that would have been something you'd see, I would say, like in the 1940s or 50s, and um, we didn't feel it was it would really be um, helpful in in marketing the theater and and making the space more of an iconic location in Bayview. Um, there's what are the, what they called old building uh, tax credits uh, that simply are part of the IRS code. And I, I want to I'm not sure about this. Please don't hold me to the percentage. But I think they're they were about 18 to 20 percent of the appropriate expenses. And still were helpful um, in you know defraying some of the costs, and um, those those I don't believe we had to really um, qualify for. That was something that we could simply utilize because they're already part of the the code, the tax code. Okay, thanks, Lee. Any other uh, comments or questions? Um, I'll, I'll also just add uh, briefly here, uh, we're currently working on a project um, which would take advantage of a historic tax credit. So, you know, the, the initial conversations that we have, that's where we'll just try to figure out all the potential options that might be out there uh, for the project. And, you know, something like new, uh, new markets tax credits or, you know, historic tax credits, whether it's in an opportunity zone, you know, there are a number of different opportunities depending on where the building is located that might be available that the individual might not know about. There might also be some resources from WEDC in Madison. There might be some things that WIDA can do. So we really just take, you know, I, I didn't want to go into all the details of all the different options that are out there, but that's kind of, you know, I, I feel like the initial meetings that we have is more of a discovery session where we just kind of vet the deal and figure out all that might be available. But yes, historic tax credits could definitely be used in a project like this. Thanks, Willie. So uh, Willie kind of touched on, um, you know, addition to financing, there could be a need for a project like this for a uh, public subsidy. Um, so I want to turn attention to uh, back to Rick Banks to talk about um, what resources the city of Milwaukee and DCD have to offer such a project as this? Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I think um, probably at the smaller scale is our commercial foreclosed property fund grant, um, which is a different kind of program than some of our other commercial corridor grants, but it's specifically for properties that are uh, currently city owned or that will be transitioning from city owned to privately owned properties. Um, and that, pro that grant would support up to seven. $75,000 into a project. Um, it's, a, I believe, a third of the cost up to $75,000. And with the project this big, you for sure would get to the $75,000. Um, and, and that pool of funding would be last money in, um, meaning you know, you'd know you exhaust all of your other capital stack sources before this last final um, $75,000 would be made available. Uh, but additionally, and I would not be the person to know all the details about how, how this works, but there's of course always um, the possibility of something like TIF funding um, where you get the tax rent of incremental financing and that's uh, much higher up the chain of command than I am to the folks who make those decisions. So yeah, I think those are the okay. two big, big products for sure. All right, so Rick, what would you say are either some of the biggest misconceptions about CD grants or 
some of the biggest mistakes that a developer or a builder can can make when um, working with city grants? Yeah, I'd say one, uh, the assumption that, you know, we uh, everybody's entitled to the funds or something like that. Uh, it, there's a process we are going based on, you know, need and where it's going to most eliminate blight. Uh, another thing is that a lot of the, the grant funds, um, not including the commercial foreclosed property fund grants, but most of the other funds that we have are not like grants in the sense of how people traditionally think of grants, where you just get a check cut in the mail and it's sent to you, um, but they're actually reimbursements. And so what that means is that you have to spend the money first, and then we reimburse you for um, for most of the grants, it's half or whatever that cost was. Um, and so just understanding that how that works and that you need the money up front is a big thing, as well as that it's never guaranteed that, you know, you'd be approved for whatever funding or financing it looks like. Um, you know, we still have to make the case and show that it's going to address needs in the city and things like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. And just um, also for those on the call today, um, just a reminder that uh, the Villard Avenue bid is here to help you make all of the connections with, you know, with our Ricks in the world and, you know, just really make those connections to um, any, any resource we can find to help you make the development go. So we would just encourage you to keep the line of communication open with Angelique um, uh, to move that process forward if you have an interest in a project like this. Um, so uh, Kermayeth put in the chat, um, and this is a really good question and very timely. Are there any ARPA dollars that might be made available for the redevelopment of city-owned properties like this? I think that's either for, for Rick or um, if there's someone higher on the food chain, as Rick says on the call, right. also that too. You're open to that. I could take a stab at it. I remember there, are, there were some funds allocated for uh, affordable housing development in the last ARPA uh, round. That said, there's another round coming up over the summer, so there might be some additional dollars put forth. Um, but for what I can, can remember, it's only for housing, so I don't know if there was any funds allocated for commercial property development. Okay. Okay. Um, so. Uh, also, rep fine. Representative, oh, Representative Dora Drake is on. She oh. said that she would check as well to see if there's there's funds available. Oh, thank she you. That, she said that she believes that the governor already allocated ARPA dollars. I don't know. Okay. It kind of seems like we're all still chasing wherever these are ARPA funds. Yeah, are. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, uh, Representative Drake. Um, so we're going to turn our attention to kind of the process the development process when the city of Milwaukee owns the buildings and how they get marketed and, and how people find out about them. So Dwayne uh, from DCD, um, I'm gonna turn my attention to you uh, to talk about how DCD attracts developers to your city owned properties and um, kind of that whole RFP process and how does it work? So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Absolutely, Stephanie. Thank you all for having me today. Basically, you know, we, we do internal input through the various departments with our planning staff, um, the commercial corridor team downstairs, um, real estate staff, and some other players, including the local aldermen. And, you know, as you know, Stephanie, we work closely with our bids as well to try to ensure that we can get the highest and best product out there. With, with what we do, we start with the RFP, the request for proposal. Uh, we, in, we draft that internally. We share that with our local bids to get their feedback and input to make sure that you know, we're all collaborating together to ensure that, again, that we can get something that you know, will be attractive to the street, but also will provide good services and goods to the neighborhood. Um, we just released the, um, the request for proposals for this particular building, the theater, along with an adjacent property and the parking lot. Uh, that just went out. We're doing a kickoff showing of the property um, in about an hour. For, and we welcome one and all to come through um, to, to get a firsthand visit of you know, what Nick was nice enough to, to share with us. Uh, we're going to have um, several 
showings, but um, I would say for, for the process, it, it's listed on our website, um, city.milwaukee.gov slash commercial real estate. And then all the steps with what you need to do as far as, you know, getting a scope of work, um, checking into your financing, getting a contractor to go out there with you and, and all the details are laid right there on, on our website. And then also on that listing sheet, my name and number is on there. And I'd be glad to talk through the process with anybody. I know we have time limitations right now because we'll be trying to get out to the site shortly, some of us. But um, with that being said, look at the RFP. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to talk individually or in, in, a, in a group setting, me and Angelique both or, or, or myself. So thank you for the time. And I'm very excited about this project and other projects that we're kind of working on collaboratively with the bid in the near future. Dwayne, what does a good proposal submission look like? Very detailed. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that the buyer has the capacity to, to do the project that they're seeking to do. We want to make sure that they do have the funding to purchase and renovate. And, and again, that's where we as a team, we collaborate with the commercial corridor or with the Willie Smiths of the world and the bid to ensure that we can get a sustainable project. So what I'm basically looking for is highest and best use of a property that the city has out there and then the capacity to um, purchase and fix it up. Because at the end of the day, Stephanie, we don't want the building back. We want, right. we want, we want an active uh, use out there. Okay. Thanks, Dwayne. Mm -hmm. um, and then just in closing, I'm just going to throw this question out there. Are there any, from any aspect of any one of you, are there any kind of last words of advice to someone that's thinking about doing a, a restoration project such as this? One thing that I would share that, um, you know, any developer looking to acquire and renovate or, or um, um, turn a project like this around is having a good contractor that they can trust. Mm -hmm. The deals that we have in the pipeline right now that are slow, that I'm confident that they're going to happen, but the issues end up being the contractor. So you can have the greatest ideas in the world. But if your contractor doesn't have the experience to do the kind of project that you're doing, or they don't have the financial capacity to carry the load, that ultimately ends up being your problem. And I'm sure um, uh, Mr. Edwards here has seen that situation more times than he can count with individuals with these commercial properties, which is why I get these calls where somebody will say, well, why is the city making it so difficult for me to buy this property? Why are they doing this and why are they doing that? And it's basically because the failure is typically there. It's either the financing the project, the, con the contractor may have given you a bid for this number or that number. You have that money and you think you're good. Well, if your contractor ends up going, uh, didn't have experience to bid properly, and now it costs 30% more or 40% more, well, where does that money come from? So, you know, that that's something to keep in mind, because by far, that is the biggest problem that we have with these kinds of transactions, the contractor and just the process to which they use to carry out their work. It's typically inadequate for a lot of them. And oftentimes they're more experienced with renovating a residential home versus a 5,000 or 10,000 square foot commercial building. It's night and day. Thanks, Willie. No problem. Anybody else? Okay, hearing I, none. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was just gonna mention that uh, along those those lines, besides the, the funding and everything else, if it's gonna be an owner operator, um, I would say making sure they have a very realistic business plan on how that space is gonna be utilized. Because uh, one of the things that, you know, you learn in the entertainment field, certainly in my experience, uh, and the hospitality field is how it is so difficult right now 
um, has always been, certainly. I don't want to appear naive there, but um, it's very difficult right now from many aspects. And it's going to take a very strong owner operator to operate something uh, akin to what uh, Nick's plan showed. And it's exciting. It's, it's incredibly dynamic. But um, it's going to take a real experienced operator to run that successfully so that it doesn't end up being um, sort of a, you know, a white horse that, that just comes out and, and um, generates a lot of excitement to begin with, but can't be carried on. So that, to me, that's, that's going to be as, as important as how the program, the project is funded and um, what kind of uh, team is put together. Thanks, Lee. That really speaks to the sustainability of the project, for sure. Um, and for the community as well. You know, yeah. that's, that's so important. Yep. Yep. Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm going to open this up to general questions from the participants. You can, if you want to put your question in the chat box, that's great. If you want to just jump in and unmute yourself, that's fine too. So um, I'm opening it up to questions for the panelists from the group. Training Institute that's right in the heart of the building. Oh, Fred, I can't hear you. Can everybody else hear Fred? No, I can't hear him either. Fred, do you want to put it in the chat? Would that help you? While Fred's working on his sound, is there anybody else that has a question? Okay. Fred, I don't wanna abandon you. Well, now you're on mute. Well, I have a quick question. Oh, there you go, you got it. Wonderful engagement in the conversation. Uh, just really, I just want to make a point. Um, I'm a, my family and I, we have a nonprofit organization on 34th and Villa. We've been here for more than five years, and uh, we've embraced the community quite a bit. Just as the conversation was going on, I mean, the financial aspect of, of pulling this off is one of the great concerns, without a doubt. But as we're making the concerns for the financial aspect of it, I, I just want to make a point that the demographic of this community is mainly, um, for the most part, you and, and elderly. So uh, thinking about what we're going to do with the theater or any other building for that matter, we want to make sure that we consider the, the demographic of the, the community that we're involved with. Um, we, can, we can make the buildings look better. Um, we can make the land look better. But if we're not putting emphasis on the quality of life of the individuals that live in this particular neighborhood, none of it's going to work. Um, so it has to go hand in hand. Um, as, as, we're, as we're building the buildings better, um, or the historical buildings and all the buildings around it, as, we, as we're putting money and emphasis and time and efforts and resources into building the buildings, we have to put that same type of emphasis on, on building the community and building a better quality of life mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, medically, um, all the way around the board. Because without that, without embracing the community, without embracing the individuals in the community, and, and as I said, the majority of the individuals in our community are elderly and youth. So if we're not focusing on that, as well as building the buildings back and making them look nice and everything, it won't be sustainable. In Absolutely. If I could, if I could speak to that, um, I can tell you that uh, much of what we're doing is being driven by the community and community visioning sessions and community feedback. Um, so. Um, I think our hearts and minds are in the same place as yours. Um, and I will also say that uh, our commitment from Havenwoods and the Villard, if I could be so bold as to speak on behalf of the Villard Board, um, is definitely serving the community and being mindful of that. So I appreciate you reminding that, reminding us of that and reinforcing that because that is so important to be able to serve the community in, in everything that we do. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, it was a question that I have for um, uh, for Willie Smith. He did make mention about him giving out a email address. 
Um, and I was trying to see if that is still uh, something that he, I don't know if he had given it and I missed it or if I can uh, get that from him one more time. Willie, uh, can we put that in the chat for the gentleman? Yeah, I think Willie, Willie, I think you accidentally direct messaged me your email address instead of putting it in the chat. Yeah, you did. Yeah. All right, we'll also, put it back in the chat for you. And then also yours as well, Stephanie, because you did make mention about um, basically any of the starting steps or steps that need to be taken to possibly acquire that. Because uh, I'm actually um, the pastor over at uh, Mount Olive Baptist Church that's over there on 36, that's right around the corner from that place. So um, Perfect. certainly, uh, Brother Collier, I, I wouldn't mind uh, talking with you as well, my man. Um, you know, meeting with you about that as well. Um, cause that was certainly one of the ideas I had when I was driving around here looking, uh, cause I'm new to Milwaukee. And so I saw that, and, you know, certainly keeping it as a theater. Uh, I heard that that's one of the things that, you know, that would have been good to do. And then I uh, certainly, I was looking at it in terms of, uh, it lends itself to the idea of what brother Collier was saying, um, of he's my idea keeping it as a performing arts theater, seeing as though that performing arts has been taken from schools and a lot of schools, um, you know, so again, for the youth, um, still having that ability and that access to a theater like that, I believe that actually would be real beneficial in this area. Agreed, agreed. Okay, yeah. Angelique, how are we on time? I think it's time for us to wrap it up. Um, okay. I'll hand um, it over to you. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. I just want to thank everybody, every single panelist, um, all our partners, residents, um, all of our stakeholders, which is everybody on this line for taking time out today to get together to have this conversation. And we will continue this. You know, this was, um, this is a first for us um, doing a developers forum, but we're gonna continue in this format. So as more properties, um, catalytic properties become available, we will start checking stuff off the list and adding more to it. So we're hoping to have another one of these in the near future, but I do um, want any of the developers or investors on the line to make sure you listen to, um, take heed to what Dwayne said is uh, really, Take a look at the RFP in detail. There's lots of pictures in there. It has a, a full schedule. So I also wanted to, th to thank the city for that. Um, like today was the kickoff tour, but they're gonna have a series of tours and they have all the dates detailed in the RFP. So, you know, we know that a lot of your teams might have to come back with contractors to. Um, so make sure you keep track of that schedule. And if you guys have any questions, um, just contact um, contact us here at Havenwoods and we'll be happy. So um, we'll be happy to help you. So again, happy Friday. Thanks again. And I hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Um, and for those of you that are coming to the tour, I'll see you guys out on the street shortly. Have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you. I want to take a picture before we Thanks, go. Everybody. If you guys want to um, turn on your cameras, I'm going to take a quick picture before we go. Ooh, all these wonderful faces. Look at that. Wow. Wow. All right. One, two, three. Everybody say cheese. Got it. Thank you. All right. I'll make sure I Who said that? I'm sorry. Somebody just asked what time is the tour. Just throw oh, the out. tour is uh, from one, one to three o'clock. All righty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Carmine. Thank you, everyone. See you later.